that we are following and proposing also then to apply to other uh, parts of the world. Uh, that sets the stage then for the subsequent uh, presentations that go into more detail. David is a strategic planning and impact assessment specialist at URI. Okay, uh, thank you, Achim, for that introduction. Uh, this is just a very brief uh, introduction, actually, to the following three presentations. Uh, but the three presentations you're, you're going to hear, they're actually part of the same study. Uh, so this provides an overview of the architecture and the rationale that links them together. Now, uh, th this study is overall a priority assessment or a priority setting study. Uh, so the objective is really to use structured information uh, concerning impact potential to inform our resource allocation across different research opportunities. At Erie, uh, this actually hasn't really been systematically undertaken since the early to mid-1990s. Uh, we've had a lot of strategic planning exercises since then. Uh, we've thought about the impact of different projects and components of the portfolio, but a comprehensive exercise to compare all the options uh, that Erie could pursue hasn't, hasn't taken place in the last 15 years. Uh, so it, it, a renewed effort is long overdue. So what we intend uh, with this analysis is basically to have an evidence-based approach uh, for orienting uh, the Asian component of risk towards a portfolio that maximizes impact potential. And that is not only through the product and findings, but it's also through the process and the educational role that it plays. So we intended this uh, study is a participatory study with the scientists uh, across the Institute of Erie, as well as certain partners. And the idea is really to engage those scientists in the process without overburdening them, and in the process that we get more of a consensus about how impact can be achieved, uh, what these concepts mean, what our assumptions are, and how we can move forward. In the end, uh, the, the product that we're looking for will be evidence uh, for strategic decisions about future directions, uh, but we don't want to fall into the trap of becoming overly mechanistic. We also hope to lead to increased clarity about our research products, the resources required to produce them, and the assumptions uh, that underpin our expectations of impact. That also is feeding into a uh, reorganization of the research structure for Erie that is also accompanying GRISP. Now the structure of uh, this analysis, the, the key overall intended findings are estimates of the economic, poverty, and environmental benefits in Asia resulting from specific investments in different potential Erie research areas. And this is being conducted in parallel to the exercise by Africa Rice that you just heard about. But we have different data and resources, so we're pursuing slightly different methods, but oriented towards the same ultimate questions. Our uh, analysis has been organized into uh, what you could call a series of steps. Uh, we start with background analyses. Then we have working groups who look at uh, problem prevalence and then scientific solutions to those problems. Then we do uh, calculations of impact potential uh, from that information that's generated, and that will ultimately feed into decision-making later. It's overseen by an interdisciplinary uh, strategic assessment task force that, that represents uh, senior scientists in different disciplines across Erie. So the, the, the first stage in that flowchart that I just showed uh, would be the background analyses. Uh, this started with some, some background intelligence collection, uh, particularly putting together some data on documented adoption to date, what is known about adoption to date for different areas of, of research, and uh, information on what other actors and partners are doing, what, where they're investing uh, their research efforts. Now this is kind of soft background information that's fed into the process later rather than a, a specific output. <coughs> then we, we went into actually preparing the background uh, for the second stage, the working group activities of looking at problem prevalence and uh, scientific solutions. So a big part of that was first to define the unit of analysis. 
And for the unit of analysis for doing that, we decided on a new set of agroecologies. Uh, and a set of agroecologies that integrate cropping systems elements uh, with the traditional rain-fed, irrigated, and seasonal uh, considerations. That will be presented along with the, the next analysis that I'll mention in, in the next presentation. Uh, we then also decided that because many eerie technologies are oriented towards closing yield gaps, the gap between actual on-farm yields and what you can consider attainable yields, uh, that we really needed to get a handle on how those yield gaps are likely to evolve over time. And that is a good cross-check on what we think individual research solutions can deliver to close those gaps. So that's uh, a, that you will also hear about in the next presentation, uh, the way we've done that through a spatial approach. So we're following this, this yield gap framework, uh, just to explain what I previously mentioned, uh, where we a large share of Erie's portfolio is really uh, oriented towards closing the gap between actual on-farm yield and what is attainable uh, given water and other uh, unchangeable limitations at the farm level. So th those are technologies that are oriented towards uh, reducing losses from abiotic stresses, uh, reducing losses uh, from biotic syndromes, and for uh, increasing uh, the efficiency of input use so as, as to raise actual on-farm yields. All of those have to operate between the attainable yield and the actual yield, so that's the envelope for those improvements. So that's why we put a fair amount of effort into trying to look at that envelope. After the uh, background analyses, uh, then we've had these uh, working groups of scientists. Uh, this, these working groups have been broken into uh, six uh, core problem opportunity categories. Uh, the first would be biotic yield reducers. Uh, the second would be abiotic stresses or yield limiters. The third would be efficiency gaps. The fourth would be quality and nutritional content. The fifth would be freestanding policy problems that aren't reflected in the other uh, groups. And then the sixth is really an opportunity category, and that's yield potential. So each of these six groups has a, a core set of scientists who've been heavily engaged in putting together, together information and leading the later uh, scientist elicitation process. The, their first task was really to uh, define uh, the problem prevalence, the magnitude uh, and distribution of, of the problem or opportunity uh, that, it, that those that fall within that working group's mandate. So uh, for, for each of those uh, key problems or opportunities that character, tried to characterize as best they can, uh, the distribution, magnitude, and frequency of the problem by subregion, by ecology under this new uh, framework of agroecologies, uh, that we've developed. And uh, they've also tried to think about how uh, that is likely to change over time. And uh, then for each of those problems, uh, they've defined solutions. So intersections of, of what we've called uh, under the GRISP are products, or in the older CGIR terminology, outputs, how those intersect specifically with the different uh, constraints uh, in a very uh, concrete and discernible way. And so we've termed those things as solutions. They're in a finer level than the products that you would find in, a, in the GRISP document. For each of those solutions, uh, the scientists have worked together uh, to think about really what's required on the scientific side in order to get to an e effective solution that could be delivered. So they've looked at the investment required, uh, the number of years required before the solution would actually be available, uh, they've looked at the, the probability of success and assumptions uh, affecting success in reaching a, uh, a solution that functions well. Alternative suppliers and when they would be likely to deliver the solution if international effort isn't uh, devoted to that particular solution. For each of those then, they, they've also gone through and they've tried to look at uh, the effects expected in the field in terms of likely adoption profiles and different points in time, expected on-farm costs and benefits changes to input-output use as a result of uh, adoption, 
as well as environmental externalities uh, that would be associated with the changes in practice envisioned, and what kind of delivery and extension requirements are necessary in order to actually achieve the levels of adoption that they've forecast. This is a process uh, that we're mostly through, but it's still ongoing. Um, it's been a long iterative process of uh, scientists coming together, making estimates, then us more collectively reviewing those estimates, and then going back and giving feedback to the scientists who, who originated the, the estimates, making revisions and, and slowly adjusting things till we get to uh, a set of, of estimates that we all feel uh, we have good confidence in to, to the degree that it's possible. Uh, we will then, uh, as I mentioned previously, we'll also do some more triangulation uh, by looking at what we expect in terms of gains compared with the evolution of yield gaps. Once we go back and, and, and get those estimates more finalized, then we'll start to use them with our survey data uh, to look at what they really mean in terms of input-output effects and effects on uh, the unit cost of production. That will be used in the trade model uh, to look at the price effects of the changes in the unit cost of production. With that price response and the on-farm data, then we can start to look at what the actual farm level changes in revenue and benefits are. And uh, we will then do distributional analysis to, to try and identify how they, they also particularly work out for poor consumers and producers. We will also have a supplementary exercise to look at environmental and health impacts. Using both uh, the environmental uh, effects from the on-farm adoption as well as more indirect effects through land use change. So just to give you a, a flavor of the, of the kinds of findings uh, we intend to have at the end of the process without revealing the second presentation, uh, there was a somewhat similar exercise undertaken uh, a few years ago by the International Potato Center. Uh, and it, had, it revealed some, some quite interesting kinds of findings. It showed, uh, for example, that uh, there was a great difference between uh, the uh, expected number, the cost efficiency in terms of raising uh, one person out of poverty between uh, research to raise productivity and value adding market chain research. Uh, it showed that uh, there was a uh, relative disparity between uh, the share of poverty impact expected across their two commodities uh, relative to their actual allocation of the research portfolio. And it also showed great differences in terms of what was expected across different regions. 